And now back to Butte, Willie Geist, it continues. So Joe, finally, after almost a full hour of a tweet storm, the president, while skimming the trees, brought it in for a landing. Finally, <laughs> with one last, one last tweet, he says the lying and leaking people, people doing the report, also Bruce, Bruce Orr and his lovely wife, Molly. What? Uh, Molly? A fun note here, that's not Bruce Orr's uh, wife's name. Her name is Nellie. <laughs> But he just dropped a Molly in there. Uh, adds Comey. Close enough for rock and roll. Adds Comey, our guest in a moment, John Brennan, Clapper, and all of the many fired people of the FBI. Will they be listed in the report? Corruption, we the DNC, ask. Clinton campaign, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't think he's okay. And with us now, we got former CIA director, also the star of the president's latest tweet, John Brennan. So he's a senior national security and intelligence analyst for NBC News. Also with his former chief White House domestic policy advisor under President Carter and former ambassador of the European Union and deputy secretary of the Treasury under President Clinton, Stuart Eisenstadt. So, uh, Mr. Director, um, what what do we expect to see and today? Forgive us for laughing. It's just... I, I don't know what we expect to see today mm -hmm. based on that, that tweet. I think Mr. Trump is seeing more and more of the walls closing in on him, mm -hmm. which is why he is becoming increasingly desperate. But I think some of his tweets just uh, indicate how ill-suited he is for the presidency and also some of his handling of some of these issues, I think just demonstrates again, he is uh, incompetent. From what you know uh, and what you can tell us, um, what should the president be most fearful of in the coming weeks? Well, I think the Mueller investigation is, um, I'm not saying it's coming to an end, but I think it is building to this crescendo with the reports that are coming out. Um, who knows what sealed indictments are already out there? Um, and uh, now that uh, Mr. Trump has given his written responses to questions, I think Bob Mueller and the team are going to feel um, that they can move forward with some of the other shoes that will be dropping on the people who are in the inner circle. Does Donald Trump, uh, from what you know and what you can tell us, does Donald Trump have much to fear from <clears throat> Vladimir Putin, from Russia? Do they have him in a compromised position? Well, I think if you just look at his tweets and his comments and his increasingly desperate attitude, I think he has a lot to fear, which is why he <coughs> continues to try to delegitimize the Mueller team's efforts and the investigation overall. So um, Mr. Trump knows what he has done in the past. I think he has demonstrated a lack of ethics, a lack of principle, um, and uh, whether it be in his government uh, affairs or in his private business dealings, uh, this is something that's going to, I think, come back and haunt him. Some of Don, let's, oh. let's, let's shift from Mueller to Russia to Saudi Arabia, some of Donald Trump's apologists say that what uh, happened in Saudi Arabia, what happened to a Washington Post columnist, this just happens in the matter of course in a lot of countries uh, that we ally with. Could you blow that lie to pieces right now? <clears throat> well, I think it just demonstrates how unprincipled he is. He clearly likes people with money. He likes people who can do things for him and advance his own interests, whether it be on the business front or on his presidential front. And so, therefore, turning a blind eye to what was a horrific, horrific murder. And it's clear now, as a result of the briefings that have been given, that Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, authorized that killing of this journalist for the Washington Post. This is something that the United States should never ignore, and a president of the United States should come down like a ton of bricks yeah. on the Saudi government and make it clear to King Salman and the rest of the Saudi royal family that you have your fate in your own hands as far as the U.S. relationship is concerned. And if Mohammed bin Salman stays in power, it is going to be to the great detriment of the Saudi kingdom. You look at uh, the way the president's responded to the Saudi crisis. We look at the way he's responded to Vladimir Putin for some time. Uh, do you have reason to believe that uh, much of, of the president's uh, obsequious behavior towards those countries have as much to do with his own financial gain in the past and possibly in the future as it has to do with his political fortunes. Yes, I do. Policy. I, I feel that he has been driven by money, by his own financial situation, his profile. And so all of this, I think, continues to be wrapped up in his approach to these very important national security issues, where he puts, first and foremost, his interests 
financial, business, personal, ahead of the countries. Stu, perhaps the United States would not be in the middle of a trade war with China if there had been Trump Tower Beijing a long time ago, maybe a hundred-story hotel. Uh -huh. uh, but, but that is not where we are. Uh, we're in the middle of a trade war. Uh, we're coming up, I guess, on the 40th anniversary of uh, the normalization of relations. Yes, we January. relations now, 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, 40 years later, uh, things are looking fairly bleak. Where do we go from here? There's no question but that China's trade practices are really unacceptable. They're forced technology and joint venture requirements, actual theft, subsidization. Of Can you put a number on that theft, by the way? It's in the tens of billions of dollars, but it's more significant, Joe, because what they want to do is to dominate the new 5G 21st century technologies. They can't do it internally, so they're stealing it. So you can't measure it just in terms of dollars and cents. It's really the fact that they will be able in artificial intelligence, driverless cars, uh, all the sensors that will be coming up. They can't develop it quickly enough themselves, so they're stealing it. So, Stu, let me ask you why this has been such a difficult uh, problem for the United States to tackle. I remember in 1995 and 1996 and 1997. Uh, passing, uh, I never voted for it, but uh, MFN uh, legislation for most favored trade status to China, and we would always say every year, okay, we're going to pass it in 95, but they have to stop stealing our intellectual property. A year later, they're still stealing it, we pass it again. A year later, they're still stealing it, we pass it again. They, they have been ripping off our companies. Yes, uh, I mean, for I've, I've been involved decades. in sort of two cycles. One in the actual normalization of relations, which Dr. Brzezinski was involved with and President Carter, and then with President Clinton when we got them into the World Trade Organization. And they have this persistent problem. They have a very different business model. It's a sort of state-driven capitalism, and it is unacceptable. The question is, how do you deal with it? And I think the way that it should have been dealt with is by getting our European allies together with us, because they're suffering from the same problems. Instead, by going after our European allies on things like aluminum and steel, we've actually divided uh, and given China a gift. Now, I think the real reality that came out of the G20 summit is despite all the rhetoric, the president realizes he does not have all the cards. He said this is an easy trade war to win. Trade wars are easy to win. Yeah. They're easy to win because, you know, they have a big surplus. He's found just the opposite, no. that we don't have all the cards. That's one of the reasons the stock market is wobbling and growth is slowing. And he's not going to want to go into 2020 election with a trade war. So I think he's going to declare whatever he gets, which will be some increase in spend, spending by China on our goods, some reduction in their theft, perhaps some reduction in their joint venture requirements, and he'll declare it the greatest trade deal ever and go about his business. Of course. He cannot go into 2020 with an all-out trade war. Of, cor of course. Uh, so, so, Mr. Director, we have uh, quite a few new members of Congress coming in. Uh, we'll be sworn in early January. Um, Advise them on on how to uh, approach China. What, what, how should they view China? Is China a rival? Is China an enemy? Uh, how how do they approach their their view on China? Well, I think they have to get briefed on China and China's evolution over the years. It is a big, powerful country. In some areas, we're going to compete. In some areas, we can work together. Uh, they clearly are trying to pursue a this one belt, one road strategy, which is going to spread China's influence and presence around the globe. But they are encountering problems with that um, in terms of the different types of instability and war and conflict in different places that are disruptive to some of their aims and intentions. And I think Xi Jinping is facing some criticisms now. It's not serious in my mind in terms of any type of threat to him. Internal? Well, some of it is internal because the, the profile now of China has risen and it is uh, causing some reaction including from Washington. And I think one of the things that Xi Jinping has tried to do is to avoid confrontation, continue to push the envelope. But unfortunately, there is confrontation now. And so people are wondering whether or not they're moving too fast, too 
and with too high a profile. And so we're going to have to see how this is going to evolve over time. But the new members of Congress need to understand just how wide and broad the China's, China's influence is. Their role in, in terms of North Korea, their role in cyber, their role in different parts of the world, in the Indian Ocean, in the you know, South China Sea. There are many different aspects of Chinese foreign policy and economic policies that are interrelated. And so there are no simple sort of uh, right. solutions to the China problem. So much to get to. We're going to have more with Director Brennan and Ambassador Eisenstadt after a quick break. We'll, we'll be right back. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.